Hello, my name is Sylvia Pierce, and this is the seventh lesson in our series that we're doing, Romans 5 through 8. So I hope you've been following along with us. We're excited about this series. Like I said last time, we're going to have a written guide, that, that a study guide that actually goes with this series so that you can sit down with your people in your own home and go over these very important scriptures because I believe, and I've heard other people say the same thing, that Romans 6 through 8 is really the key to the whole Bible and certainly the key to living the Christian life. And and uh, uh, knowing that really we're, we're dead and Christ is our life, which of course is the name of our ministry, Christ Our Life Ministries. So, and we say it's the Liberating Secret, which is of course the our name of our radio program. And we hope it won't be a secret for long because this is, this is the day when the Holy Spirit is unveiling uh, of mysteries. And, you know, it says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 it says that Christ in you is is really the only hope of glory and the mystery of the gospel somebody called me the other day and said you know in your book you say something about mystics could you t please tell me what a mystic is because that sounds sounds scary it does sound scary to people uh, a mystic basically is a person that unveils mystery and I thought well Jesus was a mystic and actually, the Bible is a, is a mystic writing because it's unveiling mystery and what has, that's been beforehand been been a mystery. That's why we call it the liberating secret, because the Holy Spirit in this day and time is bringing this message of of our true identity to Christ to the whole body of Christ throughout the whole world, and that's really why. That's the whole purpose of our ministry. We started in the beginning of Romans 7, the last time that we talked, and I need to reiterate uh, the first four verses to you again, basically because, you know, my son and I had a discussion. He says, Mom, I don't think you were very clear on the first four verses. So, I do. I want to I be as clear as I can be, and that's really why we're going to have the study guide, and also we're going to have a discussion at the, at the end of every chapter in Romans that we do it. Chapter 5, we're going to have a discussion time. Chapter 6, the same. 7 and 8, we're, we're going to have a discussion time. That hopefully some of these points can be made more clear because that's what we're about. We're about unveiling what beforehand has been nothing but mystery and now it's being revealed to the whole church. Okay, now, and then by the way, a little footnote to that. Uh, it's not that it hasn't always been here on in the Bible. It always has. It's not a new mystery. It's not anything new. But uh, there's times and seasons for everything. And God is getting ready to burst this out into, into His body. I see that with all my heart. And I'm just so thankful to be a part of that. And I know that many people are beginning. The church worldwide is beginning to know that it's by grace and to live by grace and to walk by faith and Christ in you but uh, the Christian world has, has yet to been to know the the secret of how we get the final victory in our life and it's because we see our we see that the human has never had an independent self and that's what Romans 7 brings out that's why I love doing it and I have written a booklet which I plan on reading uh, during this time and you can find that booklet on the internet if you look in on the liberating secret under authors and under me then you will see uh, what I've written on the Roman 7 and if you click on that you will be able to copy that out and actually it's part of a commentary that I, I'm doing because uh, I've done a chart presentation for years called what is man 
and it is one of the charts in that presentation. So you will see at the end of it, it will say moving on to the next chart. Well, I'm still, it's work in progress, so it's not quite finished yet. So let me start with, uh, again, with Romans 7, 1 through 4. Let me read it, and then we're going to talk about it. Because, um, as my son uh, pointed out, it's a, a, it's a metaphor. So let's read it. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them which are that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband liveth, she marries another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is freed from the law, so that she is no more adulteress, though she be married to another man. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. That's the point of Romans 7. By the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That we See, the whole point of the gospel is that we know that we're really dead to the old marriage and our old husband. We didn't die. Actually, he died. He, his um, dominion over us died. His dominion carried with it his own sets of laws, you see. And that died. When, when I died uh, with him at the cross, you see, that old marriage died, actually. It was severed. And so, in that day and time, they didn't, they didn't really talk about divorce. So, it, a, a man had to die, actually, before he, the woman would be free to marry another. So, that happened in the body death of Christ, which we have discussed over and over again. And so, what this metaphor is saying, there's one woman who represents the body of Christ, or the Christian, and two husbands. Before the Christian was saved... The, uh, that one woman was married to the old husband. The only way that she can be free and dead to the law is is to die, is, is that he die, that she might be released and then married to a new husband, which, of course, is Christ. So that death actually brings forth that possibility because he died because what really died at the cross was the satanic spirit was delivered out of the woman and so, who, who is really uh, the Christian or um, uh, the body of Christ. And then, then now we're free to marry uh, another husband, which is Christ. And like our, good, our old mentor said, we never have a, a place where a, we're a widow. You know, it's immediately. Once, you, once one is dead, immediately um, you move right into the, ne the other ma marriage. And in that other marriage, you are dead to the law. So that's why we Christians no longer live under the law. If you are living under the law, you're living more in the Old Covenant than you are in the New Covenant. Because in the New Covenant, you know, His death, burial, and resurrection made you free from the law. And you are dead to it. Now, I always say this. It's not that the law is dead. It's forever there. We are dead to it because we're dead people. A dead person cannot respond to an outer law. See, the Old Covenant is based on outer requirements, outer laws and traditions. The New Covenant is He will put a new spirit within us and He will walk. He will cause us to be the righteous people that He makes us, forms us to be through His cross. So you see, it's an inner uh, life that's lived out through us and that inner life is Christ Himself and He keep perfectly keeps the law because He's the fulfillment of the law. And he does it through us. Instead of it being an outer requirement, it's an inner life. And so, if you're still living as if there's so many outer shoulds and oughts and outer requirements, you see, that's really the religious spirit. I mean, what we're talking about is moving away from the religious spirit into the life lived out. A life lived in me and out through me. So... Now we're, what we're going to do at the rest, part, the rest of Romans 7 is discover how Paul in his own personal life, how that worked out in him. And uh, I'm going to read part of my booklet, but let me finish reading all the way down to the 6th 
verse in chapter 7, starting with um, verse 4 again. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. The only way that a man and a woman can bring forth children or fruit is that if you're married to the right, you're going to be bringing forth fruit of whichever husband you're married to. Before, you brought forth fruit unto death. And actually, that's what the next verse says. When you were married to Satan, you brought forth fruit unto death. Married to Christ, you're going to br bring forth fruit unto God, which is a, a righteous fruit. And so then the next verse says, For when we were in the flesh, that means before we were saved, because really Romans 8 says we, if you're a saved person, you're not in the flesh. You might walk in the flesh as if you are still a flesh person. But that, and you'll be condemned if you do. But that's not the truth about you. The truth about you is that you're not in the flesh. So this is talking about pre-salvation. And it says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, worked, uh, did work in the members of us to bring forth fruit of death. You see, so you've got to have the right husband in order to produce the right fruit. But now you are delivered from the law. Amazing statement. Delivered from the law. Delivered from outer shoulds and oughts. Now we always think of the law as like the Ten Commandments or some of the Jewish um, you know, traditions or uh, dietary laws or whatever. And most Christians think, well, I don't, I don't live under the dietary laws or any of the Christian law of circumcision or any. So, so I'm not living under the law. But anybody that lives with any uh, requirements that, uh, that seem to be apart from who they are, you're living under the law. You're living under the should and ought to fulfill some kind of requirement in your life, whether it's to be a good wife, a good... You don't even have to um, go hear all the shoulds and oughts that you might hear in the religious world. You'll be saying it to yourself. Well, I ought to do this. You know why you're acting that way and thinking that way is because you're thinking and acting as if you're separate from your husband. So you're acting as if you're, you still have the, a relationship with your old husband. And he's dead. So why would you have a relationship with a dead husband? You wouldn't. That's a good point. Okay, now verse 4 says this. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So even reading the scripture, you know, when I saw myself as separate and I was under the law still being a Christian, I didn't think of myself as being under the law because I only thought that was Old Testament stuff. I didn't realize the depths of how the law was in my being. I read the scriptures as shoulds and oughts. I read the scriptures as requirements instead of promises. This book is a book of promise, but if you're separate in your thinking, you're going to read it as if, uh, because you're thinking really with this, your old m mind, which is a satanic consciousness, thinking, I've got to fulfill these. And I can remember when I was first saved, I wanted to be a witness to everybody I saw. And so I bought all kinds of tracks and I had boxes piled in my house, and every time I would go somewhere... I would take a bunch of them in my purse and I would go to a restaurant and I would think, oh, I've got to give this track to this uh, this waitress. And then I wouldn't have the strength to do it or the power to do it. So I'd slip it under my plate or in the restroom. I'd leave it on the sink in the restroom because I really, I didn't have the courage to do it. And so I was always condemned thinking, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? See, I'm trying to fulfill some kind of outer law that I had for myself until one day I was in the scripture and I read this scripture. When you're thinking separate, you read the scripture separate. That's the point I want to bring here. Now, Acts says this, and I love this verse. It's in Acts 1.8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the utmost parts of the earth. Well, how did I read that scripture? That I should be a witness first in my own home, in my own family, then in my own hometown, and then to the world. And so I've made it a requirement. 
Now that scripture doesn't say that. But to the mind that thinks that's reading everything by the letter of the law, that's what Romans 6 is preaching against. Okay, now you don't have to even read the scriptures from the separated mind that is, that is legalistic and read every scripture as if I've got to fulfill that in my own strength and power. So, one day the Holy Spirit gave me illumination to that scripture. And it said, it doesn't say should be a witness, because that would be a law. It says, I shall be a witness. That's a promise. All of a sudden, I realized that the Bible was filled with promises that I had turned, I had made law. I had made requirements for, uh, from my human. And what I'm doing is making requirements from my own humanity. Like I could rise up independent and be, and that's really old man thinking. That's not who I am, and that's not the new covenant, but I'm acting as if, because I'm still thinking the old way. That's why I always say we have the heart of Jesus, but we think like the devil. We think in separate we think in a separate sense. So, because I think that way and put all the requirements on the vessel, and I don't realize that I'm just a simple container of the life of another, and he's the power in me, and when I don't realize that, then I'm constantly beating myself up, or it's Satan really beating me up from the outside of me, try, beating me up because I don't live under the law, and I don't fulfill those requirements of the law, and so, and then I start hating myself and thinking, what is wrong with me? Well, that just sets up the whole dilemma of Romans 7. And that's the whole thing about Romans 7. Where, why does this happen to us? Why do we end up in a spin trying to do the things that we don't want, that we know we should do, but we don't have the power to do? Basically, it's because we're coming from the mind of Satan and not from the mind of the Spirit. And we're still walking in our flesh. If you're coming from a satanic consciousness, you're going to be walking in your flesh. You're going to be walking as, as a condemned person that condemns themselves and, and blames everybody else and, and lives in self-condemnation and self-hatred. Now, what Romans 7, when taught the, the right way, and I always say there's many ways Romans 7 has been taught, and I've said this before, that a lot of Christians think, well, Paul was talking about himself before he was even a Christian. He wasn't even a Christian then. I don't think that's true. And um, if you get my Romans 7 little booklet, and I'm going to read, I'm going to just read that booklet because I enjoy reading it myself because I think... <laughs> It's pretty good. I look Sometimes I look at the stuff I write and I thought, who wrote this? And then I realized, oh, the Holy Spirit did. But praise the Lord. And, and you know what? I sent this booklet to a friend of mine who was a theologian. This, he is a great man of God and a, and a true theologian. This man read, read this little booklet and he said it lines up perfectly with what the scripture is saying in the Greek. So I think, cha-ching, hallelujah. You know, the Lord gave me a little bit of... Um, clout there, although, you know what, the, the clout that I'm speaking from and teaching from is really simply the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit has given us as, as the truth, as he unveils it to us. And by the way, I've had many, many Bibles, and usually uh, I can look at my Bible on the edge of it, and, and there's a little place in the Bible that's real dark, gray looking, the rest of the pages look white or gold or silver, however it might be. And then there's this, these, these little pages right in the middle of my Bible. And it's Romans 6 through 8 because I've poured over this many, 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 many times. And the Holy Spirit keeps giving me illumination. You will never stop reading the scriptures and not get new illumination. That's what makes them living and alive. And the reason they're living is because the one that wrote the scripture lives inside me. The Holy Spirit himself. And actually, I always say the, whole, the Bible is only a second witness of what, and, uh, and, and the written word when we have the indwelling word. And actually, James calls it the engrafted word. So engrafted in us. So the engrafted word. And, and, and you know what? The tr these truths and how to interpret this, these scriptures are right in you. Because the Holy Spirit is your teacher, is your interpreter. I mean, I'm not really. I'm just, I, all I intend to do is just give you confirmation to what you already have within. But you have to be honest 
and be willing to sit and really listen to what these scriptures are saying and not have preconceived ideas. Now, what I had was a religious box, preconceived ideas, and I was not going to listen to anything else. Well, I encourage you to take the walls down off of your religious box and just see what the Holy Spirit has for you as he unveils this chapter, one of the most important chapters in the Bible, to you in a way maybe that you've never thought of before and what, let the Holy Spirit teach this to you. Then after I share these things, forget what I've said and wait on the Spirit to reveal to you exactly how you're going to say it because you're not going to say my words, praise the Lord. Don't, uh, we, don't, we don't want poly parrots. We don't want people just, just uh, parroting what we're saying. We, our hope is that the Holy Spirit will give you revelation on what this is saying. And once you have the revelation, you've got it yourself. And now the Holy Spirit will then give you understanding and give you words and give you ways to say it your own way. And that's our hope. All right, let's start in verse 7. And I'm going to start reading my little booklet. And if... Um, You've got the study guide. It's certainly going to be right there in the study guide. Otherwise, it's going to be, um, uh, it is on the internet under The Liberating Secret, Authors, My Name, and Romans 7 is where it is. Okay, I start out by saying this. Romans 7 through 7, 27, and that's starting with verse 7 going all the way through to the end of the chapter has been a, one of the most debated over segments in the Bible, and that is true. That's why I like to go to the places where most people don't understand. I love that about the Bible. I do that all the time. Anytime there's a controversial thing in the Bible, that's where I want to go. <laughs> I can't help it. Well, anyway, some say Paul was not saved when he wrote it, while others agree that he was a Christian, but they say that the struggles and wrestlings he had with himself was his permanent condition throughout his whole life. And I'm telling you, that's what most people will say. That's what most Christians will say. Others make the point that we humans have two natures and we, like Paul, will always war with an evil human nature. That's another thing most people will say. None of these opinions ever satisfied me. The question then is why Paul moved from generalities concerning his union position being dead to the law. We just read that and in verse 4 of, of, of Romans 7. Concerning his union position being dead to the law to his own strivings about his present tense personal I. That's Romans 7, 7 through 25. And do and can we Christians have two natures at the same time? That's a big question. The Bible doesn't support any of these explanations. So what is our answer? That's the big question. And by the way, the front of my booklets is called Romans 7, subtitle, What is Wrong with Me? And I think that's probably what every Christian asks themselves. If you haven't asked yourself that, you will, <laughs> because it's a common question. I believe that Paul did a big thing by moving from his own realized union, backtracking from being dead to the law, to align himself and identify as an intercessor with every born-again believer by using the present tense, I, I, I. I do that myself. When the need arises... I can be all things to all people. And I can, I'm talking about myself personally right now. I've moved back to talking about myself personally. I can uh, identify myself with anyone. I find myself speaking as if I am right where they are, even though it is not presently true. I consider that God's love. Just recently, I had the privilege of uh, speaking at a boys' school where there were little boys 11 to 18 and the Holy Spirit had me go right back to when my mother hated me and how I felt and how I felt like I had no one in my life and 
the boys thought I was just living there right at that time. But yet that's God's love because I was identifying with those boys and how they felt unloved. And my point was that everything and everybody will fail you, but Jesus will never fail you. Okay, so you see the Holy Spirit does that often, and I believe that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing here. Now let me read you a scripture, and then I'm going to end, and I'm going to continue this the next time. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 22. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant to all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I become as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To the weak become I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made myself to all men, that I might by all means save some. So he's making himself uh, uh, as if he is just like all men. That's identification. That's what love does. It identifies with everybody. I believe that is just what Paul did in Romans 7, 7 through 25. He expounded on his past experience as if it was his present condition in order to identify with us all. Oh my goodness. Now I think I'm going to stop there because I want to continue next time. We're just going to dive right into uh, experiencing exactly. Paul, you're going to see yourself in Romans 7. And you're going to see that um, until you get the Romans 7 dilemma solved, you're going to be a condemned person that lives out of self-condemnation and self-hatred and loving Jesus but hating yourself because you can never really perform the way you really want to. And you're going to wonder, what is wrong with me? What is my problem? What is wrong with me? That's exactly the questions that Paul asks in Romans 7. It should be your questions because God wants to unveil this mystery to each one of us. What is the problem? Okay, I see that I, I know the, as a Christian, I know I'm not the one that does the good, but I blame my, myself for doing the evil. Is that true? Is it true that it is me, the human me, that does the evil? Well, that's what we're going to look into. And so wait, wait and see because the next lesson we're going to bring out exactly what Paul went through, and you're going to find yourself there. So in Lesson 8, we're going to pick this up again. So thank you for joining us. Goodbye. The more I try, the more I fall. I finally see the writing on the wall. The problem lives in what I see. A separate him outside, a separate me. In a desert land.